So today, I'm very delighted to present our guest speaker, Dr. Lisa Learn. From the Lingnan University of Hong Kong, she is Associate Professor of Cultural Studies, and she has been a very prolific researcher. She has published extensively in the area of transnational media circulations. Her recent research focuses on minority, migration, and race. She is a co-author of the book Understanding South Asian Minorities in Hong Kong, published by the University of Hong Kong Press in 2014. Her second book, Ethnic Minorities, Media and Participations, Created Belonging in Hong Kong, was published by Rowling in 2021. In the book, she examines the diverse participations of migrant minority youth in the age of digital world and also about recognition and also belonging. Her latest research explores the added precarities facing racial minority workers in the age of digital digitized capitalism. And in the next 45 minutes or so, we will hear Dr. Learned speaking on the topic, minority tactical belonging, conviviality through participation among South Asian youth in Hong Kong. So the floor is all yours, Lisa. Okay, um, thank you very much, Helena. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, hear me all right? Okay, right. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Helena, for such a uh, generous introduction. And I'm very happy and uh, I'm very uh, honored to be invited by the uh, Hong Kong Studies Initiative uh, at the UBC. And, uh, and I'm delighted to be uh, meeting you all. And um, yeah, I have been asked by um, the organizers to discuss my research uh, in terms of its contribution to a minority perspective uh, and to the rethinking of Hong Kong. And I'm also supposed to articulate my discussion to the theme of community building through some of the cases I highlighted in my recent book, uh, as Helena has just uh, mentioned. Uh, indeed, this recent book uh, represents some milestones in my research into ethnic minorities, which I'm going to uh, talk more about. Um, in particular, what is commonly uh, labeled here in Hong Kong as South Asians. Uh, and uh, for the past 12 years, I've been um, you know, looking into the kind of uh, complex engagement of these uh, second to uh, third generation South Asian youth um, in Hong Kong. Uh, not just as a nuanced struggle for uh, you know, their identity, but also a struggle for recognition and belonging. Um, so I'm going to share screen now. Uh, I think this is a new uh, um, Yeah. Right. OK. So. Um, I think I, when I first started uh, looking into South Asians uh, in Hong Kong, I think uh, these are some of the basic questions that I was trying to ask myself. Um, why are most South Asians in Hong Kong remaining in the lowest ebb of society, despite the fact that their ancestors have been here for centuries? Um, they, they were, some of them were here even before my you know, ancestors came. So, and then the research became a fascinating but humbling journey which took me to different sites of others, experiencing diverse sights, sounds, and smell, beliefs, and lifestyle. Most of all, I have been continuously impressed by the amazing talents, energy, and determination that my informants displayed, where I'm confirmed that where there's a will, there is always a way. So I wrote this book, as it now stands, as an extension of the earlier book that I co-authored with Professor John Annie, uh, by focusing on the agency created means of participation of ethnic minority uh, uh, youth, as well as the nuanced tensions um, that they uh, struggle to voice out against the mainstream, but also a desire to belong. Um, the four stories that I shared in this book was not just about celebration of their talents, but also their struggle to be recognized as Hong Konger. 
in the end, the stories connect not just with those of many ethnic minority communities who once as migrants find themselves other in places they call home uh, in various pockets of Asia and beyond. And interestingly, by the time I wrote the conclusion, these racial minority communities engagement became so much more entwined with that of the Chinese majorities. So I think what I'm going to do for the next 45 minutes or so is to briefly outline a few um, conceptual frames or notions that I've been working around um, and by way of substantiating my thinking for um, minorities' perspective in Hong Kong, if not minority studies. So um, I really do uh, look forward to your feedback and comments uh, and suggestions. And so, and, uh, so please feel free to jump in and ask me any questions. So these are the conceptual frames that I've been working on. I'll start with talking about uh, minorities as a, what I call the, a frame of inquiry or even a method. Um, minority participation as a kind of agency from performance to activism. Um, my notion of tactical belonging, okay, you see a hyphen, uh, um, if between be and longing. And then uh, last of all, um, what I call as uh, communities of practice or convivialities of practice. So minorities, uh, as we all know, refers to persons, groups or who are not considered mainstream or majority, hence uh, not belonging to the norm or not belonging to what considered majority in terms of uh, demographics, age, gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, but also aside from these general references, I was uh, uh, using majority, uh, minority as a kind of subject position or subjectivity from which I developed this so-called lens of inquiry. Um, I started off with uh, working uh, from this uh, critical multiculturalism approach, which as we are all aware, it's um, being a critical evaluation of the kind of structural or circumstantial inequalities um, uh, and of course critiquing the more conventional idea about multiculturalism, uh, resulting from what I call minoritization. You know, so you know these groups of people have uh, been minoritized or marginalized, but then in turn they also uh, develop this culture of what we call self-minoritization. They become so entwined in their own groups, they don't bother about the mainstream, they don't seek any help or any resources in the mainstream, but then also from limiting their or constraining, you know, their uh, engagement. Uh, this is more like uh, applying to second or a second or a third generation of migrants in which their identity is, uh, shall we say, more nuanced, uh, being hyphenated, uh, which also means that you know, there is a certain kind of dilemma or even tension as they negotiate you know, their own sense of belonging and struggle against the majority. So uh, in the case of these uh, you know, South Asians in Hong Kong, this is especially the case, uh, which I think, you know, especially uh, the three South Asian mi um, minorities that we, I was referring to uh, are the Indians, Pakistanis, and the Nepalese who have had a long history of settlement in Hong Kong, yet the majority of them are still facing multiple layers of um, minoritization. So, I mean, you know, as you can see, you know, there is this level uh, of engagement that I can use minority from, but through this, um, I'm really hoping to develop this uh, minority as a frame from which uh, we could uncover or even reclaim the voice of these otherwise uh, minoritized or silenced. Uh, from this, how we can rethink or even subvert current perspectives, narratives, discourses, or even, you know, um, politics that could otherwise be majoritized. And from here, of course, to create some uh, possible new knowledge production. So, um, tactical belonging. Uh, from this, um, uh, of course, the 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 uh, the, uh, the area of you know uh, the kind of minority engagement certainly points to the notion of uh, belonging or even citizenship uh, that you know I've been working uh, my research on. 
Uh, but throughout this process, and especially uh, um, articulated in this recent book, uh, I was using the term belonging, definitely, um, um, deliberately, you know, separating, you know, the be and the longing, which I find, you know, quite useful and resonant in this case. Um, what I call as belonging is actually, you know, um, cons constitutes two parts, the be as to be to, to assert one's identity, to, uh, yeah, to be recognized, uh, to be, you know. Uh, but then, of course, there's also this longing, right, uh, to state this uh, identity against the mainstream, but also to express this, um, you know, uh, rightful claim, shall we say, or even desire to be included, to be belong, okay. Um, to articulate this ambivalent or even contradictory affective expression of attachment to a place uh, and the consequences of it. So, I think this is, uh, you know, mainly the idea of tactical. And of course, you know, you know, the, the using of uh, various diverse tactics, uh, uh, repertoire, narrativities to express this belonging. Um, okay. Um, Participation. Um, I mean, of course, you know, uh, in the, the, the more general sense of the word, it's basically engagement in public affairs. Uh, it's usually used in a more political, you know, sense uh, of the word uh, to reflect how you know groups of people uh, um, express their engagement okay, through public activities, through you know, using of resources and discourses, uh, especially in terms of ethnic minorities. Um, and of course, in the in the uh, you know the age of era of uh, advanced media technology, this kind of participation is also complicated by both online and offline practices as a kind of key agents to constitute to public sphere and civil society building. Here, of course, I'm also borrowing Habermasian notions of uh, participation. Uh, participatory, you know, how it uh, realizes, helps it realize the kind of democracy from below. So again, of course, here I'm also referring to a large area of, of scholarship, uh, notably by Nico Carpentier's notion of participation, uh, where I also um, coin it as mediated minority participation to denote the strategic use of mainstream or social media uh, by minority groups to express, you know, their identity, but also a desire to belong. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, uh, according to uh, Toast, it's also participation through the media deals with the opportunities for this kind of mediated participation in public debate, for self-representation in the variety of public spaces that characterize the social. It also renders the act, the practice, and the result of that participation as connective, uh, meaning, of course, you know, through online practices also, uh, the game, engagement of different platforms for solidarity and mobilization, but also in the end, through these spaces, uh, realize the kind of transformer, transformation of uh, communication. Okay. Uh, what Carpentier would call a transformative project. So, from participation, I also uh, 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 was aware of you know, this emerging important area of scholarship, which uh, you know uh, identifies itself as performance studies, uh, where I would think that you know performance is also a form of participation, but it also focuses on the more creative or artistic forms of uh, this you know activity. Um, and because of that, you know, how could it open up spaces of transversivity uh, or even hybridity? So by performance, I think uh, it also you know, uh, expands you know, this, these acts of participation from conventional sites of advocacy, like you know, what we would think of as activism right, in public spaces, but, all, but uh, extending it to even like theater, but also the everyday public spaces. Uh, spaces. So from uh, the uh, delicate moves of uh, such as blank stares, arched eyebrows, body tension, or even silence could be a material source 
uh, for creative effective expression of these of subordinate people. By articulating these, uh, it basically uh, um, points out to you know a, a more you know hopeful thinking or even methodological you know, importance that these narrativity, these different small acts, uh, even everyday life, could reflect the kind of um, you know deeper uh, expression of identity, uh, the practice of the performers, their self-reflection, and also possibly the impact of these performances on the audience's perception. So um, I think uh, here I also you know try to combine these notions. Uh, to articulate the kind of participatory performance, okay, uh, uh, and uh, also focusing on social media as a site of minority performance, where racial minorities engage in mediated space to stage such a kind of performance. Um, how through the concerted efforts of racial minority youth create new connective solidarities of communities of practice, and how through these participatory efforts, racial minority news could induce transformative communication and possibly change. So lastly, you know, I'm also talking about communities of practice, where driven by shared interests of practice, uh, project teams are guided by shared goals and results. Um, these boundaries are uh, basically, you know, break all, breaking, uh, broken open, uh, how learning could be, you know, and a reflective engagement through dialogue in an attempt to make sense of and create meaning from uh, these experiences. And uh, in a lot of these uh, you know, um, racial minority studies, there's also a reference to conviviality, uh, especially re referencing the kind of spaces and practices and the resulting solidarity of, you know, um, to signal effectively at ease relations of coexistence and accommodation among diverse cultures, becoming that occurs intersubjectively. And uh, yeah, how the spatial ordering of urban spaces could conduce to you know intercultural habitus and um, by conviviality, of course. We're also talking about the kind of embodied, habitual, sensuous, and even affective uh, that uh, carries over beyond the moment between happy and hard coexistence. So these are the concepts that I've been working uh, around and through uh, in order for me to better understand and articulate the kind of nuanced you know, um, practices of these uh, second and third generation uh, racial minority use in Hong Kong. Okay, so um, let me just give you an overview of, uh, for those uh, in the interest of those who are not too familiar uh, with my uh, research and also with, you know, the, kind, the, the, the situation of uh, South Asians in Hong Kong. Now, uh, of course, some kind of uh, discussion about uh, uh, what I mean by South Asian, why I do that. Um, of course, um, in Hong Kong, uh, you know, the, uh, the term ethnic minorities basically, you know, are uh, uh, often, uh, you know, uh, assumed as uh, the, uh, with a pejorative kind of reference, you know, there are many ethnic minorities, including, of course, you know, um, Europeans, uh, Americans, uh, East Asians, uh, and so on and so forth. And here, the, you know, uh, the demographic uh, distribution of what we call ethnic minorities uh, in Hong Kong. These are older figures, but they also you know, are rep quite representative of the current you know, 2021 census in Hong Kong. But then ethnic minorities, the term or ethnic minorities in public discourses usually refer to the more, um, the more sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word, um, more grassroots, you know, kind of ethnic minorities, and most often than not, you know, South Asians. And by South Asians, uh, we often refer to the three ethnicities, the Indians, Nepalese, and Pakistanis. And uh, for reasons I'm going to elaborate later, 
Um, so as you see, you know, these three ethnicities are definitely a demographic and uh, minority in Hong Kong because altogether they constitute only like 1% of the total Hong Kong population. So you're talking about like, you know, seven, um, seven, 70,000. Yeah, 70,000. Okay. So uh, these are, here are some of the photos uh, of, um, you know, um, the Indians, ne Nepalese and Pakistanis, and forgive me for using the term salvations. Um, yeah, they, uh, they are, they have a very long history in Hong Kong. And as uh, for people who are more familiar with uh, Hong Kong history, they are basically brought, you know, to, uh, to Hong Kong by the British colonizers back in you know, 1850s, uh, when they uh, usually arrived uh, uh, employed uh, to join the army and uh, the disciplined forces. So you see on the right, you know, there's this uh, very classic photo um, of a Sikh, you know, in a turban uh, alongside the Chinese uh, uh, policemen back in the early, you know, colonial, colonial days. And uh, the one in the middle, they, these are the ne Nepalese and, and uh, they are often, um, you know, recruited uh, by, uh, as guru Gurkhas. So basically a, 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 a specific kind of battalion, you know, they're known to be really sort of uh, um, feisty and strong and tough and healthy. So you know, they're very good, you know, as soldiers. Um, and then of course, some others were employed to join the police force. And the photo on my left is actually uh, a police headquarter in Sanling. Uh, now it's, uh, I think it, it, there, yeah, it's still a married headquarters, but not just by, um, by ethnic minorities. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this gentleman here is, you know, is a retired you know, Pakistan policeman. So just to give you an idea, you know, uh, how and why they were uh, mostly recruited. And of course, you know, we also see uh, some of the uh, later on, you know, some of the Indians especially came to Hong Kong as traders and uh, businessmen. Um, and um, um, yeah, so um, so they have had a long history in Hong Kong, but then for many reasons, you know, they still remain what I call you know, the lower end uh, of society. Uh, here comes, of course, another, other forms of minoritization. Uh, for example, you know, what I call structural minoritization. Now, um, to put a long story short, um, throughout the years, you know, uh, because they are, you know, a demographic minority, uh, for many, many uh, other reasons, uh, for because of uh, the lack of policy, lack of regard for their needs, uh, uh, um, you know, as uh, second generation, third generation, uh, South Asian youths, you know, grew up, uh, their lack of resources in education, and uh, many were barred from, you know, entering university because of the Chinese requirements. Um, here is, you know, uh, some um, uh, figures. This is uh, actually, you know, some update figures about, you know, the kind of educational attainment of uh, comparative educational attainment uh, where you can see that, you know, at certain levels, lower secondary, upper secondary, and post secondary uh, uh, levels, uh, you can see um, quite a sharp, you know, uh, uh, distinction between, you know, the attainment of uh, uh, Pakistanis and Nepalese, especially, you know, in uh, degree courses uh, in Hong Kong um, compared to that uh, by of the Chinese. Uh, which explains, you know, the effect of, you know, putting a Chinese language requirement as, you know, a necessary, necessary university entry requirement has effectively barred a lot of, you know, these South Asians from entering this university. And of course, as we all know, you know, the impact of that is uh, a perpetual or even persistent, you know, de deprivation of economic opportunities and social mobility. So you are talking about not just economic minoritization, but also social minoritization. And according to you know um, the population census, many of those, uh, especially Pakistanis and Nepalese, still uh, work in what is called elementary occupation. Now, 
the using of the term elementary is actually quite, you know, says a lot, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, what, what is elementary occupations? Basically, it means, you know, uh, jobs that, you know, require menial skills, right? So you find, you know, security guards or construction workers or cleaners uh, for women, you know, working in, you know, sort of as cleaners in hospitals and hotels uh, or, or street cleaners. And so you're talking about, you know, not just uh, deprivation of, you know, uh, social mobility, but also a concentration of these ethnic minorities in, you know, these so-called, you know, uh, grassroots, uh, you know, labor. So, um, yeah. And of course, you know, it's not surprising at all that, you know, these uh, minority groups actually uh, end up uh, being one of the poorest groups in Hong Kong. Um, this is uh, figures 2016. Uh, the same figures appear in 2018, uh, but then, you know, there's no, um, you know, no further, you know, uh, statistics uh, dedicated to, you know, uh, the poverty rate by uh, different ethnicities, which also show another kind of even more deep-seated minoritization, which is, you know, a lack of public accounts or even government accounts of, you know, the situation of these people. And, you know, what I also argue is, you know, this kind of structural minoritization is also discursive, meaning that, you know, uh, their invisibility or divisibility not just about you know uh, current government or governments, uh, them not appearing in policy papers, them not appearing in government discourses. Whenever they appear, they appear as a kind of you know uh, oh you know they are you know they require uh, specific resources, they require more economic resources. Hence, of course, they are a burden. But beyond, besides that, you know this kind of invisibility. Has, uh, has been there for ages, and most problematically, they are invisible in historical literature. I mean, if you look at Hong Kong history books, you know, there were records to Indians uh, or, you know, sometimes Pakistanis and Nepalese, but it's really scanty, you know, sporadic. And whether, whenever they appear, they appear, okay, they are hired as, you know, uh, in the disciplined forces. And then there were various you know, anecdotes of them, you know, sort of, you know, not behaving, you know, um, uh, appropriately and hence, you know, ending up in, you know, in jail, you know, um, all these malpractices. So which goes back to this kind of negative, you know, uh, uh, discourses, negative vice discourses. So by the by, you know, basically they are invisibilized uh, in both uh, historical and public lectures. Uh, to the point where, you know, uh, in back in the 1990s, uh, uh, an NGO called Unison um, and headed by Fermi Wong has, uh, you know, spearheaded to use uh, ethnic minorities as a kind of collective term for, to bargain, to argue for pu more public resources because, you know, they are because, you know, of the demographic, you know, minority ness of these ethnicities. She thought that, you know, by grouping them in as a collective term, then, you know, they could bargain for more research. And lo, and lo and behold, you know, uh, after the 1990s, that also spearheaded the formation of uh, racial uh, discrimination ordinance and then more resources. So in recent years, I have to say, this situation has improved, but there's still a lot to, to do. And uh, uh, um, um, apart from this, of course, another kind of discursive invisibilization is, of course, about racialized representations in films, um, where you know uh, these are different films in which, of course, you know this is not unique to Hong Kong. Um, uh, it's racialized representations is happens uh, everywhere, um, and you know, um, and in Hong Kong, on the right, you have got one most, uh, you know, uh, prominent uh, Indian actor in, in Hong Kong. And he's like, you know, one of the very, very few. Uh, uh, others, uh, they, are, they are, whenever uh, South Asians appear, you know, they appear in mainstream films, they appear in, you know, sort of uh, cop films where they are always the baddies. 
uh, all of their appear in you know sort of comical uh, comedies, comical roles. Uh, whereas of course you know uh, this one on the left, uh, white guys. This is Hong Guangwen. Okay, um, uh, one of the uh, prominent uh, white actor in Hong Kong TVB. He always appears you know as a uh, positive right you know roles. And of course, this is not new. Uh, you know, this uh, we can refer to, uh, of course, the stereotypical representation of blackface. Of course, these are very different contexts. Uh, in Hollywood films, there are a lot of racialization. Um, okay, apart from these fictional, you know, media, of course, news becomes another major agent of negativization of media discourses. Like, say, for example. Um, South Asians uh, has been linked with uh, this term called fake refugees uh, in Chinese daily especially. And more recently, uh, the, there's this uh, you know, COVID-19 breakout in Jordan area uh, where you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, the, this uh, in, in Jordan area where a lot of, uh, you know, um, Pakistanis and Nepalese uh, uh, live. And of course, you know, um, soon, soon enough, you know, uh, the Chinese dailies, you know, um, uh, reported the, these photos, uh, and of course, to confirm, you know, uh, the 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 uh, reports saying South Asian gangs removing them from Mars and violating the social gallery, creating an impression that you know they are the cause, they are the agent, you know, of infection, and of course, confirming the kind of stereotype you already have you know, about. You know, um, uh, darker skinned uh, racial minorities, what I call racial minorities, not just ethnic minorities, because this is a, you know, very uh, blatant kind of racist, racist, you know, comments. And which sparked off, you know, this famous incident whereby, you know, on, on the uh, food panda and delivery platforms, food delivery platforms, uh, there were customers who uh, blatantly, you know, voiced out, no South Asian rider, please. All right, leave door, leave at door after ringing the bell. No South Asian, uh, Indian Pakistan riders. And this sparked off of, uh, an outcry, a public outcry on social media and in public, uh, which forced the, uh, the, the platform to ban the account, uh, apart from, you know, um, uh, conceding to the many demands you know, they made uh, um, in their, do, uh, during their protest strike. Uh, if people want more information, we can talk about it further. And of course, on social media, this is LIHKG, where there's some netizens were basically bad mouthing and uh, bullying, basically, um, uh, the um, so called South Asians. Uh, and of course, this is not new, uh, this is not unique. Um, scholars have been uh, coining this platform. They just, so rather than you know, opening up more democratic dialogues, social media is also a site of platform racism. And not surprisingly, I've been doing, you know, uh, a survey back in 2021 of the public perception of uh, South Asian, South and Southeast Asian uh, Asians in Hong Kong, and it's actually really, you know, predictable and also very consistent with uh, uh, statements, positive statements like, you know, um, uh, our members of Hong Kong uh, or are friendly. You can see, you know, there is a distribution of responses, uh, which basically uh, shows that they are they are negative, right? Where where one shows disagree, and a scale of one to ten from disagree to agree, you know, you can see there's a consistent pattern here. Whereas, you know, for negative uh, statements, it's the reverse, right? Uh, of course, some of them are even more, you know, odorous, you know, agree, you know, 33%. Okay, so, of course, uh, um, you know, there's also everyday uh, racist uh, acts, which I, you know, in the interest of time, uh, haven't got too much time to, you know, uh, go through, you know, each and every one of this. Um, okay, so for the rest of the time, I'm going to spend... Uh, Talking about these three uh, three stories um, uh, of how you know uh, second third generation um, South uh, Asian Indians uh, multi multi ethnic ethnic youths uh, would use social media page 
uh, to voice out their uh, identity. Now, this is the first uh, uh, story. Uh, I focused on this page, Facebook page called Minority Initiative Hong Kong. Now, of course, as the, as the title uh, implies, you know, they are casting uh, a minority approach, okay? An initiative from minorities of Hong Kong. And uh, they are set up in 2016 by a group of uh, uh, core members, uh, some of whom uh, you can see in this photo here, and you can actually see the history of these uh, you know, members. Uh, they, in, they were quite notable back in 2014-15 when there was this umbrella movement uh, where they actually patrolled the uh, site in Admiralty. Um, if people went there, you would um, imagine the site, but they uh, patrolled around the, the site carrying this banner and calling like, you know, we are one. Our voice and unity is our strength. Uh, uh, they condemn all violence, okay? And this is a very, of course, a very public and also very brave act uh, and persistent act in which people started to pick up, oh, wow, you know, this is a group of ethnic minority Hong Kongers. Um, and for this page, uh, they called published these photos on their Facebook page with the rationale to actively seek opportunities to contribute, enhance and represent people from all walks of life, take the initiative to be proud contributing members of this great city we call home. So, you know, there are a few words here, keywords here, right? You know, as you can see, it's obvious they're trying to subvert the kind of mainstream stereotype about the passivity or even the kind of, you know, um, negativity of ethnic minorities or, um, yeah. And they, are, they also claim themselves and, uh, and represent themselves as multi-ethnic. So we're, they're not just one single homogenized ethnicity, but multi-ethnic. And this what ought to be seen as a multicultural city. Now, they, uh, apart from, you know, sort of uh, posting you know, news uh, that are relevant to uh, ethnic minority groups, they also, you know, um, uh, stage uh, quite a lot of public events. Say, for example, this one on the top right, bottom right corner. Every uh, Christmas, they'll be doing caroling in Chung Sha Choi, uh, you know. And but oh, one of the most notable events is that you know they do this uh, breakfast run every first uh, Lunar New Year Day, Chao uh, Yat, where they will bring breakfast to uh, um, to uh, street sleepers, to home homeless people in. Uh, Sham Choi Po, you know, uh, well, if people are familiar with Sham Choi Po, you know, this is an old district there, are, uh, but there are also a, a lot of homeless, uh, homeless people living under flyovers and you know, sort of uh, on uh, uh, hidden corners. So we want, uh, as they post on uh, these messages on the Facebook, we want to show that we are taking care of the, even the lowliest of the Hong Kong people, when they, when everyone is busy with their festival engagement. Uh, we want to let these fellow Hong Kongers share these, you know, feelings too. Uh, as everyone is busy with family during Chinese year, you know, what better way to show solidarity by serving warm breakfast to those who need, need it most. So here in this posting, of course, there's a very strong message that, you know, we are showing solidarity to, you know, the marginalized, the forgotten, you know, people in Hong Kong. Even the Chinese, you know, the forgotten Chinese. All right. Um, an initiative like this make us feel human. Um, homelessness is an issue, uh, and uh, yeah. And see, you can see on the left. You know, these are some of the photos uh, that just give you, just just give you an idea. You know what the, that space looks like and the community, right? Yes, you can see. You know, it's a gathering of different ethnicities too. You know, it's not just about the, the minority, uh, or the, all they are all ethnic minorities. But then uh, also, you know, um, um, you know, Caucasian, you know, families bringing their children, you know, to do these really charitable, charitable and meaningful acts. Uh, and this is another, you know, of uh, their initiative, uh, as we might remember back in 2018 when Hong Kong was badly hit by Mankut, Typhoon Mankut. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, they gathered, uh, um, you know, again, you know, a lot of ethnically diverse people in Hong Kong where they clean the streets uh, littered with, literally littered with a lot of branches, rubbish, you know, debris, and they cleaned it. Uh, this is also a gathering of uh, refugees and asylum seekers, as you also see on, you know, both photos. And then they, of course, posted these uh, fo photos uh, with reflection on, on Facebook. Uh, congrats to us, what an emotional um, morning, showing their achievements, cleaning off all the rubbish, uh, how dedicated each of for us to recovery efforts in Hong Kong. Refugees are Hong Kongers, ethnic minorities are Hong Kongers. We share the same values and ideals and care about our city too. The other thing uh, is that, you know, what I call as performing, you know, multicultural unity um, or performing a gen more genuine kind of cosmopolitanness on Facebook, where, you know, they show the photos and achieve, you know, morning uh, after delivering their breakfast, a gathering of different ethnicities, also including Chinese people in some forgotten corners under the flyovers, you know, in Sham Shui Po. So, um, yeah, and these acts were actually recognized by, you know, mainstream news media, uh, Hong Kong Zero One being one, uh, where, you know, they uh, recorded, you know, um, we are Hong Kong. Um, um, what I argue as you know, a sign of recognition, but also uh, by the mainstream, by the racial majority. Uh, but of course, these reports are not reported in all Chinese names. And that, in fact, only a few reported these, these acts. Now, again, you can see that, you know, I put a hyphen there. Uh, uh, for me, I uh, just want to articulate this kind of rec recognition. It's a recognition, uh, because in my, my interviews too, you know, these kind of acts not just cause recognition, but also rethinking a recognizing, you know, uh, of, you know, what it means, you know, being an ethnic minority in Hong Kong too. There is a lot of these inter-ethnic reflection that is shown through these acts by ethnic minorities themselves too, uh, if not just for the Chinese. Now, I moved on to the second story. Uh, this, I, I don't think I need any too much of a, an introduction. This is a, quite a famous stand-up comedian in Hong Kong, Vivek Bhubani, himself born in Hong Kong, uh, an Indian born in Hong Kong, but uh, um, his parents were practical enough, if not smart enough, to send him to a Chinese middle school. So that's why he was forced to learn Cantonese, uh, write Chinese, apart from speaking English. Uh, what he did was actually uh, that he uses life stories, adopting a first-person narrative in its oratory to forge a direct rapport with its audiences. Now, um, well, and in the interest of time, I yeah, I'll probably show uh, a little clip if I can. Mm. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why. Okay. Let me, sorry about that. Oh, 
咁啲人就會同我講啦，唔係喎，你有黑人著數，喂 ，hip hop 咁樣入樽優咁樣。<笑>我係一個啡色皮膚嘅叉仔，一個印度人，淨係可以多毛同埋一陣咖喱味嘅啫，真噶。咁我話俾你知啊，喺香港做一個識講中文嘅外國人係仲慘，真係，因為會成日令人失望噶。你諗下，你見到一個外國人行過嚟，哇，好學下英文，講下呢個英文。教佢幾句中文幾威啊！見到我就唔得㗎啦，係咪？我有一日喺街市嗰度買嘢，咁我諗住買啲生果啦。見到個生果佬我行過去，佢見到我好開心。誒、hey, 朋友，過嚟朋友，好靚啊，好平，好正，朋友，好新鮮。跟住我行過去見到我，你你你唔使咁講嘅。Sorry, I in the interest time, I'm just gonna give a, a very brief um, uh, translation for the for the interest of a, you know, uh, yeah, uh, friends. Um, basically, was uh, he was uh, he was basically uh, working around some of the stereotypes about Indians in Hong Kong. Like, uh, well, I'm 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 actually not you know uh, uh, considered you know that I could speak English well. And then he was actually later on using this joke, you know, where he went to the wet market one day. You know, and and then the 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 the, the, the hawker was uh would say, "Hey, Pang Yao," you know, sort of try to mimic you know the kind of you know sort of the kind of academies or the accent you know according to in the Indian you know what Hong Kong people Chinese people think of you know the Indians. So Pang Yao, okay, and then you know he was using his very fluent Cantonese to reply him, and to which of course you know the hawker was like so shocked, and then he was like, "Oh." Okay, just go ahead, you know. And then at the end of the day, you know, he was like, "Oh, he took pity on this Chinese peddler." He was like, "You know, okay, oh, I'll have four." Pang Yao, you know. So just trying to, you know, revert that kind of, you know, joke onto, onto the uh, uh, the, the 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 Chinese uh, peddler. Um, then and and you know, and then you can hear, you know, there's a lot of laughter, you know. Uh, but then you know he has got a lot of other jokes too, which I haven't got time to share. I, I realize that I'm really running out of time. But then uh, what I'm trying to say was that you know this is a kind of fluid discourse, so uh, discourse reversal, like you know reversing you know the discourse, showing it, shouting it, throwing it back you know to the Chinese mainstream um, through humor. Okay, uh, but those you know he used his own you know sort of life experience. You know to do this, and you know uh, he was he was he was uh, getting the audience, the Chinese audience, to laugh, but then also laughing at you know the kind of you know predicament that you know uh, Hong Kong Chinese people could cut and could uh, could be you know could be involved in right you know uh, because of those stereotypes right. So so he became very successful uh, with his kind of line of jokes uh, and. Uh, when in a, a few interviews with him, you know, he was saying that you know I'm I'm just uh, I I don't feel that I'm I'm actually you know, being a you know uh, using this kind of uh, uh, ethnic comedy as ethnic com comedian in elsewhere. I'm just using my own you know sort of life experience. Uh, I prefer finding ways to make people self reflect because it's often the way I handle situations. Um, yeah, but uh, of course you know. Um, Hopefully, by laughing, I hope they could reflect on some pertinent social issues and my life experience about the day-to-day -day problems of ethnic minorities. I would like my audience to question the long-held stereotypes about South Asians. Um, okay, so uh, and then of course you know there are there, he received a lot of comments uh, on YouTube. I agree with you. Very touching, nice performance. Uh, they're hilarious, but yeah, the society has still a lot of stereotypes against the South Asians. All right, I have to really, really quickly, you know, go uh, to the, the last one, the last story. Um, this is a, a um, this is a, uh, this is a series of fashion show organized by a uh, former uh, refugee uh, who herself is Congolese. Um, this is Harmony, is the the female lead of this story. Um, 
she uh, has uh, aspired to become, you know, a, a model here in Hong Kong. But then he was, she was facing all sorts of, you know, uh, you know, rejection, which she she deems it as racial discrimination. And of course, you know, it, discrimination could uh, could happen every day. You know, like you know, people deliberately, you know, uh, leaving their seats when they, you know, sit down. You know. So all in all, you know, she thinks that you know, there are a lot of racism in Hong Kong. And because of that, you know, that actually encouraged her to start her own fashion show. And in the course of three years, she has organized six fashion shows and not just, you know, staging her own self, but she gathered herself a group of multi, uh, ethnically diverse, you know, uh, models, as you can see here, a few of them. Uh, and this is one of the, the photos of one of the fashion shows. Uh, in which this Pakistani um, uh, uh, model actually wearing her hijab because she is required to, but then she was also, you know, hybridizing with, you know, this uh, modern design sari. So you can see a lot of, you know, transgressivity and um, and hybridity in terms of fashion, but also the kind of, you know, uh, communities, you know, harmony gathers. Um, I don't think I have time to uh, show you, you know, video clips of that fashion show. But if you want to, I can show you after, after my presentation. Um, again, you know, um, what I'm trying to focus on is the kind of conviviality that comes out from what I call communities of practice. Because, you know, um, it's not just about the gathering of models, but the whole, you know, organization from front stage to backstage to the kind of the musicians, the hip hop dancers, the jazz singers, you know, the, the African drummers, they invited to the fashion show uh, was a, definitely a gathering of multi-ethnic talents. And of course, you can see, you know, the audience themselves are also multi-ethnic, multi-racial. So this is what I refer to as a kind of conviviality through fashioning, in inverted commas, interculturality. And I was interviewing a lot of these models and the designers who join these fashion shows. They love the vibes coming out from the fashion show. So what is the vibes? Okay, what is so particular of this vibes? I guess it's the kind of identification and feeling, you know, you're blended uh, with a multi-ethnic communities as a, a, a stark difference to the general culturally homogenous public spaces in Hong Kong. And because of this, you know, the kind of energies, the artistic energy that knocks off from uh, each other makes it an even more tight knit and more intimate kind of community apart uh, compared to probably other, you know, other such kind of fashion shows. So, so this is from an Indian fashion designer comments. So, um, so I'm just going to try to quickly, you know, conclude here. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, uh, I was trying to demonstrate through these stories the kind of tactics of participatory performance, were like, you know, gifting, you know, present in the case of social media pages, how they mediate the gifting uh, as a way to shame the Chinese names, uh, the majority, um, you know, a Hong Kong Chinese majority and also performing the kind of multiculturalism, uh, a genuine kind of multiculturalism, let me say, albeit uh, kind of more kind of a less extent, okay, uh, online and offline. And in the case of the fashion show, how they perform this, not just diversities, but diverse civilities, transgressing spaces, realizing communities of professional interracial practices, how this kind of conviviality uh, articulate the kind of intersectional but also intercultural uh, 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 solidarity and how they to uh, induce a kind of recognition, you know, uh, among the Chinese mainstream. So I guess I end up, you know, trying to talk more about my preliminary idea of, uh, you know, how to move on from, you know, these stories. Um, I guess there are some obvious, you know, uh, projects that I really would like to uh, uh, embark on. In fact, I'm doing it to reclaim the silent voice of ethnic minorities, especially in terms of reclaiming the history of their settlements that have been disappeared 
uh, or misrepresented in colonial accounts. So you know how to re uh, re re uh, re uh, reclaim a kind of minority cultural history, shall we say, and to situate this minority perspective uh, uh, of Hong Kong, of South Asians in Hong Kong, by relating it in the inter-Asian context. Of course, because we share a common colonial history, uh, but also differ uh, in terms of our you know, economic development and social specificities, how the Hong Kong uh, you know, minority situation could be compared with those in uh, the interracial or even you know, in the global diaspora. What narrativities of minority tactical belonging can we find out of this process? And how you know, the growing concerns of intersectional politics could inform efforts of interracial or even intercultural solidarity. So I'll, I'll end here. And um, also with a comment of, um, you know, by Vivek uh, at the end of uh, the uh, 2019 movement, uh, in which he was not he referring to Hong Kong not being a race, but a mentality, a mindset, a way of thinking. Um, to, to, to try to suggest that you know, at the time, at the juncture, when we find ourselves to be increasingly minoritized, we might find ourselves you know, having to learn even more than we think you know, from these ethnic minority groups.